I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, our plenary session on status and trends. My name is Palmer Huff. I'm an environmental scientist at EPA headquarters, and I'm going to be your session moderator this morning. I'd like to start, uh, to, to start again by, by recognizing the incredible work of Carlene and her team. This is just another phenomenal conference. It's so important to bring together the community of regulators, the community of mitigation providers and customers for this kind of collaboration. This is, this is the kind of stuff that really advances the, the policy and practice of, of compensatory mitigation. So please join me again in thanking Carlene and her team. So our panel has worked really hard to put together an engaging and exciting session designed to get you up to speed on everything you need to know about the status and trends of two very important environmental mitigation markets. All the presenters are going to present first, uh, and then afterwards we're going to take questions from the, from the audience, so, so, so keep your questions bubbling until, until everyone's done. Uh, our, our first presenter is going to... Uh, <clears throat> give you a characterization of the, the number, the type, and, and distribution of mitigation banks and in fee programs that are approved to provide offsets to impacts to wetland streams and other aquatic resources, as well as touch on some trends uh, in permitting uh, for aquatic resource impacts. Uh, then we're going to learn from two independent researchers uh, some of their results of their evaluation of the time it takes to get these kinds of aquatic resource projects reviewed and approved. Uh, after that, we're going to turn to uh, the perspective of a mitigation provider who's going to share his insights uh, from his analysis of recent trends in aquatic resource, uh, the aquatic resource mitigation market. Uh, and lastly, we're going to hear from the Fish and Wildlife Service who's going to give us uh, an update on the status of uh, the number and distribution of conservation banks that are designed to provide offsets uh, to impacts to listed species. So first up uh, at the podium is going to be Michelle Madsen. Uh, Michelle's a professional ecologist with over 25 years of experience in both the private and the public sectors. She currently works uh, for the Institute for Water Resources, the CORE's Institute for Water Resources, where she's focused on implementing the CORE's compensatory mitigation program uh, in compliance with the 2008 mitigation rule. She does this by providing expertise in the development and evaluation of mitigation banks, in fee programs, and permittee responsible mitigation. So please join me in welcoming Michelle to the podium. Hi everyone, thanks Palmer. Um, my presentation is not that exciting, so, um, but it is important, I think, for us to keep abreast of the growth of this, uh, of this program, right? You've all put in so much um, time and energy and money into the program. So um, I'm gonna characterize uh, the Clean Water Act 404 portion of third-party compensatory mitigation from 2008 when the rule was finalized to 2022 using the Corps' regulatory ORM data as well as the RIBITS data. So, uh, I have pretty much just said this. So I'll go over the areas that are covered by mitigation banks in Luffy programs with some beautiful maps from Ribbits, uh, the relative amount of third-party compensatory mitigation, the types of, uh, of activities, restoration activities um, are used to generate credits. Uh, recent Ribbits updates. Ribbits is always being updated, but they're, you know, every year we report out on some uh, substantial updates to make things easier for you. And then um, really what's next in third-party compensatory mitigation. I'm not going to get into that too much. I hope that we talk about that um, in, in Q&A. So you've mapped, if you're, if you're one of the people that, um, that come to this conference regularly, you've seen this map. This is the coverage of mitigation bank service areas. Um, in 2008, so essentially what was, what was there right before the mitigation rule or as the rule was, um, was finalized. And you can see there's a lot of area that's not covered by mitigation banks. I don't have a similar map for in Luffy programs, but their coverage was, was quite small um, at this time. 
So here's a new updated map, flash forward to just you know earlier this calendar year. This is mitigation banks and in lieu fee site service areas. Lots of coverage, huge expansion, um, ex expansion into 43 sites or 43 states. And let me look to see, I think that's an increase in, excuse me. Yeah, so that's an increase from 26 seven sites last last year 30 I'm sorry 27 states uh, were covered by mitigation banks and in leafy programs in our data uh, last year approximately up to 43 sites and I think that's primarily due to in leafy programs a big expansion of in leafy pro in leafy fee programs they now are um, in 38 states, some of them cover the whole, the entire state, and there aren't banks in those. Um, but that's that's not common. It's more common for there to be overlapping banks and in lieu fee coverage. But a total of in lieu of 104 in lieu fee programs, and um, and I think I've got the number of sites here. I'm sorry. There's 526 service areas, but that doesn't give us. Um, the number of actual sites. I apologize for that. Okay, so this is core regulatory ORM data. This is the number of permits that are issued that require compensatory mitigation. As you know, there are many permits issued by the Corps of Engineers that do not have permanent impacts or that have very small impacts and don't require compensatory mitigation. So these numbers might look small to you, but this, the green bars lump all standard permits, including letters of permission, right, which are really uh, fairly small impacts, particularly for things like regular maintenance and that kind of stuff. Then the yellow bars are general permits, and that includes those nationwide permits, regional general permits, etc. So on average, um, standard permits, about 30 or so, 33% of standard permits uh, require compensatory mitigation. That's a bit higher. It's more about 45% for just nationwide permits, which is the, a very common you know, way of, of permitting mitigation banks through nationwide 27. It's pretty much the only way, sorry. Um, but for um, uh, for general permits, it's it's always around that 8% because those are minimal impacts and so not very many require commensurate mitigation. I have this extra data here um, called out in this box on just the number of permits that the core issues. It is a very large, very active program. Um, and so I just included the data from the last two years. In 2021, 40,000 uh, permits issued. That's a lot of permits. And in just one year, that jumped by 9%, uh, you know, to 41 or so, uh, 44,000 permits, with no increase in budget as far as I understand. That increase in budget came this year. So regulators are doing more with less, and we've talked a lot about making banking uh, processing banks, you know, more efficient, and I think that this is a, a good data to support that. Okay, so the mitigation that was required generally is supported or um, is provided by mitigation banks, so the orange portion of, of this graph are credits or mitigation bank credits that were used to offset uh, permitted permitted impacts, and then the aquat and then in Luffy program, PRM uh, offsite, and then onsite. So you can see that mitigation banks by far are still the primary uh, way that compensatory mitigation is provided for the Corps of Engineers anyway, and uh, PRM has shrunk uh, quite a bit. And you can also see that this, this does help demonstrate that the um, that the hierarchy is being followed, right? By far, mitigation banks, then in LIFA programs, and then PRM. So this supports that the districts are following uh, the, the preference hierarchy. Okay, so this is the number of withdrawals from mitigation banks 
in lieu fee programs and um, uh, and, in, and in lieu fee sites. Sorry. So mitigation banks are those larger blue. Uh, bars, and this is not acreage or number of credits. This is the time that that uh, people actually withdraw to meet their permit needs, right? Test, um, test, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Okay. Test, the, test. One. They can hear me. The, uh, the, the primary thing I want to point out here is that you can see that the increase in use of in lieu fee credits shown in the green bar start around uh, the mitigation rule time, maybe a couple years later, those are the green bars, and slowly but steadily increase, right, and have stayed uh, fairly steady. Okay, so this diagram um, you can get off of ribbits. This, um, shows you what types of, of activities in the, in the field are being used to generate credits. That, inter, that interior ring is for in lieu programs. The um, exterior ring is for uh, mitigation banks. I love this diagram because I think it, it really calls out the different um, approaches by in lieu programs and mitigation banks. So if you look at the orange, I don't know how to use my little one. Boop, boop, boop. Here we go. So this is uh, the type of mitigation, so preservation, reestablishment, enhancement, whatnot. So what you do on the land to generate your credits. This is the in lieu fee program ring. And orange, which represents preservation, is the largest approach for uh, generating credits for them, where it's a much smaller portion for mitigation banks. And this is for wetlands, sorry. Um, whereas for mitigation banks, they're more active on, on the landscape and using things like reestablishment, uh, rehabilitation to generate those credits, so much less preservation. Um, the poor, something I do want to point out is that we have this 12% you know, in, in unspecified for banks and 8% in, in lieu fees. That's just, we don't know what those bankers um, and in lieu fee sponsors are doing to generate credits. So our data in Rivets is only as good as our sponsors and our regulators are able to spend the time to, um, to get that data in there. So the same diagram, but for streams. And um, different from the last one, the in lieu fee sites and bank sponsors use about the same type of restoration approaches to generate credits. So there's not a huge difference between uh, the percentages here, right? So in Luffy programs, again, the inner ring, uh, wetland bankers on the outer ring, and the percentages for preservation are very similar, reestablishment, et cetera. So for streams, using a very similar uh, approach. So Ribbit's highlights, I'm almost done. Ribbit's highlights, enhance cybersecurity. So we, again, we're always doing upgrades. This year, the primary requirement for us was uh, set forth by DOD and, and our, um, our Ribbit's lead, Valerie Lane, and our contractor, ARA, has spent a substantial amount of time this last year upgrading cybersecurity. There are um, enhanced user profiles so that users can quickly find their projects and their data, so not as much uh, time spent by regulators or sponsors if they have um, access to find uh, their information and upload their material. One of Valerie's primary focuses is making Ribbits as user-friendly as possible and working with the districts to get uh, QAQC of the data so that we can really rely on this information. And that leads me to that second point. New QAQC features for regulators as well as sponsors that have access um, granted by the districts to, um, to, mod to do QAQC or to upload data. Um, really exciting, last year we reported that BLM had asked the core to include their up and coming um, mitigation program and it has up, it's live now and soon hopefully we'll start seeing some banks and possibly in lieu programs on, on public land starting with uh, BLM. Um, there's 
more enhancements for um, for district validation of sponsor entered ledgers. So as you know, many districts allow their sponsors to upload uh, ledger sales and updates, but now they can go in and check very easily whether or not it was um, done accurately. And we're still, um, still collecting public lands data. So last year, uh, Ribbits was upgraded so that whenever anyone goes in to modify a, um, a bank or in lieu fee site, they have to click whether or not that site is on public lands and then federal, state, local, et cetera. That's important information for us to have. So if you update um, or if you can go in and update, please do. These other two diagrams here, I'll go quickly. Number of hits by users, it is steadily increasing. Um, I like to use Valerie's um, uh, you know, idea for Ribbits. Ribbits is really like the cores, at least IWR's Panda. It is used by everybody. So um, that brings me to this pie chart. You can see the Army Corps of Engineers is by far the um, biggest user of of ribbits that's here, shown here, and then the bank sponsors and in Luffy sponsors, so business, followed by other uh, federal partners and, um, and educators. And that's it. I really want to thank our federal partners. We could not have the ribbits that we do today as well as this program without our federal partners. Um, being able to work with them and overlay our data is, is extremely important for the core to be able to collaborate and do a great job. So thank you, federal partners. And that's what I have. Thank you, for, Michelle, for that, that update on aquatic resource mitigation. It's, it's always re remarkable uh, to me to, to be reminded of the incredible volume of permit activity that the Corps of Engineers uh, handles every year and the <laughs> immense volume of, of mitigation projects that they manage and oversee. It's, uh, it's also encouraging to see that, that Congress took notice and, and the Corps has gotten an increase in, in resources to help manage that phenomenal workload. So our next... Uh, Presenter is going to be a tag team of two independent researchers, uh, and I'm going to introduce them both before I turn over the podium to them. Uh, the first is, is Becca Madsen. She is the director of the Restoration Economy Center at the en Environmental Policy Innovation Center. Uh, she has over 15 years of experience analyzing issues at the intersection of natural resources and economics. Uh, she's analyzed and written on topics ranging from data science applications uh, to environmental issues, uh, global biodiversity offset policies, uh, and, and uh, feasibility of water quality trading in the Chesapeake Bay. Prior to joining EPIC, uh, she spent nine years managing and conducting research on a wide range of topics related to natural resources uh, while she was at the Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, prior to EPRI, uh, Becca worked for Ecosystem Marketplace, um, uh, the, uh, the Forest Service, uh, local, go local government in North Texas, and the Peace Corps. And I think some of your work was highlighted in uh, Todd Bindor's presentation earlier today. Uh, and joining Becca is Steve Martin. Uh, Steve's professional focus is on compensatory mitigation policy and evaluation of mitigation proposals. Uh, since retiring from the Corps uh, three years ago, Steve has stayed very busy uh, assisting nonprofits in evaluating potential mitigation projects and consulting uh, for the Ecological Restoration Business Association and the private sector. I also note that EPA is very grateful for uh, Steve's work co-authoring uh, the uh, Mitigation Bank and NLIFI Program re review workbooks and checklists, which were uh, finalized and released this past November. Before retiring from the Corps, Steve was a mitigation specialist uh, at the Corps Institute for Water Resources. His work at IWR included national imp implementation of the Ribbits database that uh, Michelle just described, um, teaching aspects of compensatory mitigation policy and practices to core staff and other agencies, and development of many tools to improve compensatory mitigation, including co-authoring uh, handbooks on financial assurances and site protection 
And prior to joining IWR, Steve worked for many years for the Norfolk District Regulatory Branch, uh, where he participated in delineations, permitting, enforcement, and compensatory mitigation. Uh, Steve is an incredible asset to the compensatory mitigation community. Uh, and he is the person that I think everyone goes to when they have a really tough question about compensatory mitigation and they want his sage guidance. So please join me in welcoming both uh, Becca and Steve to the podium. All righty. Okay, so you see a QR code up there. Um, we're gonna do a poll later on so you can use your cameras to snag that and get to the poll. You can even start um, answering that poll if you'd like, and then we'll come back to it later and show everybody's responses, all right? So um, our work, our research that we're sharing with you today is catalyzed by the 2008 requirement, or 2008 rule requirement for the approval process for mitigation bank instruments and in lieu fee instruments to be done in 225 days. Uh, we've been hearing throughout the years that the approval process is lengthy, um, but we haven't had quantitative data. So we submitted a FOIA to the Army Corps of Engineers and received data from the ORM database. And this included timestamps of, of the different parts of the approval process. And we categorized time intervals into mandatory federal processing, which rolls up to that 225-day deadline, sponsor processing, it's on the sponsor's desk, and then additional processing is this category where the, the process is going back and forth and it doesn't roll up into that 225-day requirement. So we had to do some data cleaning. I can tell you more details later. Um, but we also noticed when we cross-checked our data with rivets that um, the ILFs and rivets, there were way more. So we just thought this is not representative and so we're gonna focus most of our research on mitigation banks, so that's what you'll see here. Our research questions, the main question at the top, um, probably the most important, is the required timeline being met? And then we had these other questions uh, since we had the data and we wanted to explore things a little more. So for that top question, drum roll, uh, no, the required timeline is not being met. <laughs> uh, that's statistically significant. Um, it's taking, well, you'll see in the gray in the calendar there, that is the 225 days. In the pink is the additional time it's taking on the desk of the feds uh, for that required time frame. But that's not the whole story. Um, there's also quite a bit of time spent with a sponsor in blue and then more of this additional time in green. So that all adds up to just over a thousand days or three years and change. So this is on average nationally. For the other questions, um, one, we just wanted to um, see if there was a COVID blip. You know, maybe everything was taking a lot more time during those years. That wasn't the case in 2014, statistically speaking, the 225 day deadline was being met, the others not so much. Um, timelines are not getting faster or slower over time. And then when we looked at the different stages in the process to see if there was bottlenecks, um, the final, the review of the final mitigation bank instrument was taking um, over its required time on average, and the others were not. So I'm gonna turn it to Steve for the district. Okay, so as Becca indicated, I'm gonna go into uh, district specific data and then very briefly talk about uh, in-lieu fee program processing and how it compares to banks. Uh, what you see here is a box plot, uh, actually a series of box plots, uh, ranked by districts. The vertical line uh, is the 225 days of mandatory federal processing. Each district is ordered according to that from shortest processing to longest. And within each box plot, the black vertical line is the median processing. The orange X is the mean processing. Six districts we found had average federal processing of less than 225 days. 
something that's important to consider are standard deviations in the processing. And what you see here is for those 16 districts in that eight-year period that approved more than 10 banks. Uh, and we've ranked them or, or listed them from left to right based on the size of the standard deviation. Six districts, uh, ranging from Mobile to Wilmington, had standard deviations of less than a half of the means. This then suggests less variability in processing. In other words, approval or the processing of federal processing is more predictable. This is carrying it a step further. In addition to mandatory federal processing, you see added to each bar sponsor processing and then additional processing. That additional processing is the back and forth between the core and the sponsor before a product, a prospectus, a draft instrument is de determined to be complete. What strikes me in particular about this uh, is the great deal of variability in that additional processing and the fact that three districts, uh, Pittsburgh, Wilmington, and Rock Island, have managed to minimize that additional processing. The question is, how? Switching to ILFs, this is a comparison of bank and ILF program processing. Uh, very radically different sizes for that eight-year period. You see almost 500 banks, 32 ILF programs. Uh, we're showing by row federal processing, sponsor processing, and additional processing. If you look at the overall processing, they seem relatively similar, uh, but actually ILFs on average take two months more for processing, overall approval. And what really stands out to me is this additional processing, uh, this back and forth between the core and the sponsor. That's nearly nine months for banks and nearly 12 months of back and forth for ILF programs. Uh, here are our recommendations, and for details on our recommendations, I would suggest you go to our report, at either that or ask questions about them in the Q&A period. I'm going to pass it back to Becca. All right, great. So our research uh, was able to answer the question of what is happening in terms of the approval process, but it didn't answer the question of why is this happening? What are the factors that are contributing to speedier approvals or slower approvals? So if you go ahead and, and take a picture again of that QR code, if you haven't yet, uh, we're going to ask you what you think could, um, what you could think the core districts could do to speed up the approval process, and then we'll show it in just a minute. Um, but we did interviews um, to start to unpack this question of the factors and speedier and slower approvals. Interviews with 15 different bank sponsors across the United States representing 35 banks. So this is like an early preview of what we found. After our long interview and asking lots of questions and having a good conversation, we asked, what are your top three things that your district is doing well? And we heard that um, when there's standardization of templates um, and just consistency and how the core staff are approving things, things go smoother, right? It's predictable. You know what's expected of you, you serve it up, it gets approved, right? Um, staff is another big factor in how fast things go. Uh, we heard really good kudos of dedicated staff who have lots of experience and um, are happy to move the process along. And then leadership in the interagency re review team process was also seen as a factor in speeding things up. So we are going to ask um, now to switch over to the poll results here. So we asked you, what are the top things that could change to speed up restoration permitting? Yeah. <laughs> you'll be able to see these. If you've entered anything in, you'll be able to see these on your phone, and you can kind of scroll through these. Um, so we're probably seeing kind of the flip side of some of the, you know, what's going that helps, out, helps it out to be fast is if you have great staff and you have sufficient staff, that's great. If you don't, it's going to slow things down. Wow, there's a lot of, a lot of <laughs> ideas here. <laughs> This is great. Um, training, transparency, I agree with that too. It's very hard to get the data to understand where you are in the approval process. We had to do a FOIA. 
uh, Virginia's PEEP system, permitting evaluation and enhancement platform, shows everything transparently and where you are in the process and which, whose desk it's on and things like that, so that's great. So Steve and I are going to be looking at these and kind of trying to incorporate that into our research. Um, these are the, the top three that our interviews said was um, the top three things that could change, and I'm sure it's also kind of similar to what you guys were entering. So with that, I will stop and give you a QR code for the report so you can read more. Thank you. Thank you, Becca and Steve. It's, uh, this, this kind of analysis has been a really long time in coming, and it's really exciting to have actual data to work with instead of the, the anecdote that, that we've known for years that, that we've, had, um, we've had some struggles in this area. What gives me a lot of hope is that this really seems to provide a, a springboard for answering the next question, which is why, and, and figuring out you know, what the districts that have figured out how to do things efficiently and consistently, you know, what are their secrets, and, and then sharing those practices across the country. So I, I, don't, I see a lot of, uh, of hope and opportunity uh, in this and, and the next steps in their research. So thanks again. Uh, next up on the podium is going to be Joe Williams. Uh, Joe is the Assistant Director of Markets uh, for Ecosystem Investment Partners, a firm that provides environmental restoration solutions through large-scale restoration of natural resources such as wetlands, streams, and endangered species habitats. Joe's been a part of the mitigation banking industry since 2010 and has been involved in all stages of mitigation project development from market analysis uh, to bank permitting to credit sales. Uh, he also currently serves on the board of the Florida Association of Mitigation Bankers. So please join me in welcoming Joe to the podium. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be back uh, giving the industry update um, at this conference and this panel. I think this panel is especially um, good because it, it provides that chance to kind of take that step back and to say, okay, what's happening? on the high level in our industry and to um, have the right people at the table kind of talk about what they see is, is going on here. So, and I'm primarily going to be talking about 404 market today um, and looking at the ORMS data as well as rivets. And of course, as we saw with uh, Becca and Steve's uh, presentation, it's pretty different how things roll out in each state and in core district, but um, you know, it's taking the step back to look at the high level is, is important. So this is what I plan to kind of talk about today. Um, as bankers, and especially um, a industry that is, depends completely on the regulatory climate, we've got a lot to pay attention to. So I think a lot about how do we uphold the mitigation hierarchy, think about who's buying credits, Think about how quickly can we bring those credits to market and um, how many of those credits can we sell and when. Uh, the elephant in the room here, of course, is WOTUS because that's ultimately going to drive the size and the demand in the market. So let's get into that a little bit here. It's been a wild ride the last few years. Um, obviously, the, you know, we've 2015, the, the rule was expanded with the clean water rule. Um, then in 2019, repealed. And do pay attention to these orange um, acronyms because those are going to come back later. And I'm going to overlay it with some of the data here. Um, Navigable Waters Protection Rule in 2020, and then which was then uh, vacated in 2021 with the Pasqua Yaqui Tribe uh, decision in Arizona. Um, and we had the, in March, the revised rule was promulgated and came out. and promptly stayed in uh, 27 states over three court decisions. Wait, 26 today, because Kentucky's now going back to, um, to the revised rule. Um, so, okay, I have a pop quiz for you guys. Is the navigable waters rule still being followed in, in the US? Raise your hands if, if you think it's true. There's a couple of you guys. Congratulations, you win the conference. 
So here in Florida, the, um, the state has assumed and they still follow the navigable waters protection rule. So anything that the state is regulating uh, it hasn't been, that's been assumed is under that. Anything that the Corps is regulating is not assumed is still, is, is going to be um, under the pre-2015 rule because of the court decision. So that's where we are. We still have a long road to go. So the SACA case is still out there. If it comes out while I'm talking, please stop me. <laughs> um, we have, I know of at least four states that are looking very hard at state assumption. We have a new woods rule on the horizon, which I assume is going to kind of, depending on what happens with Sackett. And then we all, there's even another court decision out there which hasn't been talked about too much that's looking at whether or not the Chevron deference is something that, the, um, that we should continue to follow. So, which, you know, that's what the basis is of a lot of these rules that get promulgated in general. So, what does that mean for the data and, and what we've seen? Um, in the markets. So volume of impacts requiring mitigation. Uh, 2015, things were kind of normal. 2016, they dropped a little bit. I kind of think about this time as all the consultants and permittees are stop and look at each other and say, we have to do what? <laughs> Let me go get my rubber boots now and go back out there. And then the agencies look at each other and say, training. <laughs> um, 2019, the, the revised rule. So I think that that leading up to that, some folks kind of held off to see what was going to happen. Uh, Nuper came in 2020, and they prompt, so, and I think that's what we see in 2021 when the, um, the impacts start to go down, and fairly significantly. Who are the impactors by sector? So, and this is, this is data 2012 to 2021, so it's, it's, it's all together. Um, the big impactors, which is probably not a surprise to anybody, but transportation, commercial, residential, and industrial development, and mining and drilling. So, um, and it's the mining and drilling and the commercial, the, the developers kind of swap depending on whether it's stream or wetland. So this, I think, is, is one of the big takeaways here. So um, wetland impact by mitigation type and stream impacts, uh, or impact by mitigation type, We've seen just overall it's been increasing year to year, which is uh, for credits being or going towards or these impacts using credits from either in lieu fee programs or mitigation banks. So that's that's a very good outcome, and we're uh, as Michelle was talking about, we've we've seen a lot more of that. But I think this bottom chart that shows based on the number of permits. What are those each permit going to? So taking the unit from the, the, the actual impact acreage or linear feet, but per permit, how many of those permits are going to the different mitigation types? And that is a very positive story. We're, we're seeing that banks are getting a, the lion's share of, of the um, mitigation done there. In lieu fees continue to grow, and the, the permit responsible continues to, to decrease. So this data is actually from rivets, and of course, all these data, all these data sets are, you know, grain of salt, right? Um, but we've seen an increase in both types, streams and wetlands, since the beginning of the data, which has been great. We did in, in 2022, though, we did see that that a little bit of a drop off, and um, I I suspect it has to do with with Nuper, um, but that this is what's happening in the data here. And with that, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joe, for that perspective from the industry. I um, I'm, never cease to be amazed at the, the resilience <laughs> Of, of the industry in, in light of the swirl that is the, the uncertainty around WOTUS. We, um, we in the regulatory community appreciate you sticking with us <laughs> on the, the roller coaster ride that, that is WOTUS. We, we, we couldn't administer this program without, uh, without what you bring. So thanks for, for putting up with <laughs> the craziness that is, that is WOTUS. Um, 
Rounding out our panel this morning, uh, we'll, we'll hear from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Jason is Jason Miller is a biologist with over 22 years of experience uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, starting in the uh, Northeast region. He's worked in the West Virginia field office and the Chesapeake Bay field office. There he focused on civil works mitigation, restoration of Chesapeake Bay habitats, and management of island wildlife. Today he works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service headquarters in the Ecological Services Program. His work relates to many aspects of the authorities the service uses to ensure wildlife is conserved in the course of project review processes. In particular, he's focused on the development of a number of national mitigation policies. So please uh, join me in welcoming Jason to the podium. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Palmer. It's good to be back here in Florida. I actually started my career uh, right here uh, in the 1990s working for the St. John's River Water Management District, actually on a large scale consolidated mitigation site, as a matter of fact. So it's good to be here. And I'm honored to be here on behalf of the Fish and Wildlife Service and to be here with all of you that um, have done so much to innovate and done so much to conserve our trust resources. Um, in ways that advance the Fish and Wildlife Service's mission. So thank you for everything that you do and, and, and thanks for the invitation. I'll just give you a very brief snapshot oh, there my slides, of where we are with conservation banking. So the main story with status and trends for conservation banking can be seen in this table of very basic numbers. The numbers on the right-hand column are based on rivets data from this month. Numbers for prior years were taken around the time of our annual conference and go back to 2019. Thanks to the mitigation industry, upward trends do continue. And you'll we'll see that you have nine new banks relative to last year, up to 185 now. The top row is the number of conservation banks that either have a status of approved, sold out, or suspended in ribbits. And again, 176 last year to 185 now. We do have three more banks that are sold out compared to last year. Dutchman Creek, Laguna Creek, and Nicholas Ranch, those are all in California. Dutchman Creek and Laguna Creek offered credits for multiple species, and Nicholas Ranch offered credits for the Valley Elderberry Longhorn Beetle. As far as states go, we're holding steady at having conservation banks in 21 states or territories. You also see additional acres there. So the contribution to permanently conserved conservation lands across the country now stands at nearly 270,000 acres. The overall number of species covered by credits at conservation banks has also increased slightly to 76. Not all of those are species that, uh, or credits that cover species that are listed under ESA. We have credits for multiple species um, covered through state authorities, in California in particular. There are three new species that are reflected in this table. Uh, Congdon's tar plant, that's one of those, and it's also one of those that's addressed under California state authorities. Um, the other two new species are actually bats, and uh, they're species that are not currently listed under the ESA. We also know that there are more banks in the works. You can see 34 uh, pending banks are in ribbits right now, and actually 29 of those are in California. But we also have uh, two in Florida, one in Colorado, New Mexico, and Tennessee. So among the, new, the nine new bank records you can find in Ribbits are four that are in California. Those have been approved since our 2022 conference and that explicitly offer credits for species. So we have the Alton Lane Conservation Bank offering coverage for the California tiger salamander, Caetano Creek Mitigation Bank, coverage for the California red-legged frog, California tiger salamander, and uh, as well as some state regulated species. We have the North Delta Fish Conservation Bank, also covering multiple species, including threatened Delta smelt, proposed longfin smelt, um, and I should note that that's a joint bank with NOAA. We also have the Pedro Azul Conservation Bank, 2,400 acres there, the credits for California tiger salamander, California red-legged frog, San Joaquin kit fox, 
and also state regulated species. So congratulations to all involved there. Welcome to those new conservation banks. In Indiana, it was just last year, we had the first conservation bank in the state, and now here we are right away with uh, two more. The Bat Conservation Bank of Indiana, 1,600 acres, credits for Indiana bat and northern long-eared bat. Also Bear Creek Conservation Bank, offering credits for those same two species. So we have three banks in Indiana in a short period, and it's notable that all three are banks covering bats, and that's likely a trend that we'll see continue. So right on cue, in Ohio, we have another new bat bank, or a second phase of a bank, in this case, the Claremont County Phase Two Bank. This is actually the second in Ohio, first coming back in 2021. Uh, both offer coverage for bats. And again, on bats, uh, we're seeing growth in the last few years, and now in uh, four different states, there are eight separate banks offering coverage for the Indiana bat and northern long-eared bat, and that's developed in a, a relatively short period of time. Finally, right here in Florida, we have two new banks offering credits for two species of skinks. We have the Arbuckle Creek Conservation Bank and the Moon Glow Conservation Bank. Um, with those two, now we have 14 different banks offering credits for blue tail mole skink and for the sand skink here in Florida. So where does that leave us with respect to the national map? Where are these banks? Distribution is evolving, but as you can see, California has 66% of the banks. So 123 out of the 185 banks that we do have. And that uh, gap between California and other states actually grew slightly. And the preponderance there is unlikely to change soon. Uh, I mentioned before, 29 of the 34 penny banks are also in California. But after California, there's Florida with 19 banks now, Texas with nine. But again, uh, we did have several new banks in the Midwest in the last few years and several new banks offering credits for listed bat species. So the geographic extent of conservation banks is growing and is evolving. Before I wrap up, I just wanted to mention our Fish and Wildlife Service mitigation policies. Many of you have been aware that uh, we're in the process of reissuing two mitigation policies, and yes, we've been in that process for some time, uh, but we are actually now at the end of that process, thankfully. Uh, ideally, we would have had them announced by now uh, before I was standing here. Um, but all relevant reviews and clearances are actually completed and in hand, and we have a Federal Register notice that's ready to publish. So look for that in the Federal Register announcing the availability of two final policies this month. So you'll see the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service mitigation policy, that's our agency-wide mitigation policy, it lays out our broad interest in mitigation, it also integrates all the, <clears throat> the various authorities we have for either recommending or requiring mitigation. You also see the Endangered Species Act compensatory mitigation policy, and that's a more detailed treatment of compensatory mitigation specifically, under ESA specifically, uh, and it connects to and falls under the umbrella of the service-wide policy. So you'll see both of these coming very soon. Thank you. Back to you, Palmer. Thank you, Jason, for the update on the status of conservation banking. It's encouraging to see the, the numbers of conservation banks tick up, their distribution gradually uh, expand, and, and the number of species covered by banks expanding. That's, uh, that's hopeful. Uh, so you all been waiting really patiently, uh, and we've got three roving mics, so we'll take your burning questions for this august panel of experts. <laughs> Chloe has a question. <laughs> Thank you. This has to do with the conservation banks and also maybe how we're, uh, how you all are counting numbers. As everybody knows, it's in Florida here. We have wood stork credits and we also have panther credits or panther habitat unit offsets. Lots of times those are um, done in, con in conjunction with the mitigation, wetland mitigation bank project. They'll also have a separate um, uh, wood stork foraging unit uh, that, that can also be purchased at the same time or panther habitat. 
So there's a whole lot of acreage right there that I don't think is actually getting counted for conservation banking, but it is for all intents and purposes serving for conservation banks. And I mean, one example I can think of, George, um, George and uh, George from Wetlands Bank, uh, Panther mm -hmm. Island, they actually created special terraced, um, uh, terraced environments specifically to enhance wood stork foraging um, when the, between the drawdowns. So there would be more capture of, of fish species during that drawdown. And that's pretty important when wetland banks are actually also incorporating additional design features for species. Um, so I wonder, you know, if we can have some more hands across the water and really looking at what wetland banks are doing. You know, uh, um, black rail is another species that is going to uh, be listed or is, is, is going to be listed. Um, so I wanted to ask about that. How are you guys, look? how you all incorporating that into your conservation banking program? And then what's happening with the wood stork? We got notification that it might be delisted in March. Anybody want to tackle? I'm not sure I can start. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And we are aware of um, four or four banks in Florida that um, I, I think Ribbits listed, lists those credits as offering wood stork value. Um, I didn't present a, uh, a full chart of all the species, but uh, we are aware of that and we've incorporated that in uh, past analyses. I, I'm not certain whether we have the acreage um, properly tab tabulated there. Uh, but we have other situations like that um, nationally in Maine, for example, uh, Atlantic Salmon, we have similar situations where um, it's a 404 crediting scenario, but that is essentially designed to benefit that particular species. Um, in general, for us as an agency, wetland conservation, um, something that we had in past decades um, spent a lot of time engaging in for, for through 404 review, we have statutory authority to uh, review and comment on all 404 permits. Um, you know, we do so not just for um, wetland conservation itself, but for you know, systemic benefits, the ecosystems, and uh, direct benefits to affected species. So um, the connection is an important one for our agency. Does anyone else want to weigh in on the question? Okay. Others? Oh, over here. Chuck Davis with Beaver Creek Hydrology out of Lexington, Kentucky. I've got a question for Becca and Steve. I want to start uh, <coughs> echoing what other people have said, that the report's great, and we work in many districts across the country and can affirm that it's a lot of good data. But I'm going to give a counterexample of a specific district in order to ask a question. So excuse the complexity of the question here. But in the Louisville district, which showed in the data to be relatively efficient just outside of that 225-day mark on average, uh, I work a lot in the Louisville district, and I think I can speak for a lot of other third-party mitigation providers in the room that uh, the Louisville district incorporates their own letter of permission or LOP process in addition to the rule to govern uh, the review of most third-party uh, mitigation bank and NLOP projects. And consistently across many of those providers, we have much longer than 225-day review periods on the order of years, so 600, 900 days, something like that. Uh, but that's not reflected in the data. And the question out of that example is, is it possible that there are certain extenuating factors in given districts, such as LOP processes or others, that are potentially masked in that data set? And was anything done to control uh, for those districts that might have uh, entered data differently into the publicly available data that you all use to do that assessment? Um, yeah, so the analysis that you saw was just pure data, right? And we did hear from maybe a couple of our reviewers, uh, they pinged us about, well, let's add a caveat about this or that. Um, this would be a good one as well. So <laughs> we have been hearing in our interviews that indeed um, there are some districts that seem to start the clock at different times than other districts. Um, so even though there is data tracked, which is great, you know, step one, set deadlines, that's great. Step two, actually track them, that's great. Step three, make sure that tracking is not gaming the system or that there's some consistency in how, you know, how you're tracking that time. I would add to that uh, that what our analysis showed, we, uh, we broke the timestamps up into different intervals. Uh, 
the mandatory federal processing and, and the uh, uh, sponsor processing and that additional, that back and forth. And when, for instance, you look at Louisville, their average total processing is somewhere in the vicinity of 750 days for that eight year period. Keeping in mind that we had to scrub the data and for a number of districts, we had to throw out records that were obviously inaccurate. Banks that had been processed in one day. We all know that defies uh, reality. Uh, we also found some time intervals for some banks that were negative. Uh, in other words, the clock rolled back a bit. We also found uh, discrepancies between data in ORM and Ribbits uh, related to when banks were approved. ORM and Ribbits disagreed. In some cases, banks were shown in ORM as being approved and they were not yet shown in, in Ribbits. To me, that highlights the need to synchronize those databases uh, so that we have hopefully more accurate data. And obviously this is dependent on the people that are entering the data in the system. If you have uh, tens or hundreds of people across the country entering data into a system, it increases the likelihood of some errors being made. Other questions? So this question is for Michelle on Ribbits. Uh, Mark Kaiser here. A, a couple years ago, the state of Virginia and the state of Iowa uh, signed up to use Ribbits as their platform for water quality trading programs. Just curious if, if you guys have been uh, actively sought out by other states that want to use that as a platform. And then with those two states, uh, if you've been just tracking the amount of traffic on the platform. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have um, the water quality uh, data for the two states that are currently in Ribbits offhand, but yes, we have been um, uh, talking to Maryland, for example, about incorporating their new or upcoming water quality uh, credit program into Ribbits. Uh, there's always a bit of complication when it comes to water quality because the um, the data or the database, for example, in Ribbits is one of the only sort of separate um, activities. So there's not any overlap with the wetlands and and species banks. They have a whole set of different requirements, and USDA is our federal partner in that area and they typically fund those upgrades. So there's still negotiations going on with several states and we're hoping that that will happen in the next year or so. Sometimes these take a couple years. Um, for example, not water quality related, but we've been uh, working with the state of California for the last few years uh, because they're very interested in getting their uh, separate compensatory mitigation requirements into into ribbits and we are getting very close to having um, approval you know review and approval by headquarters to be able to to start that process but funding from a state to a federal agency is complicated and federal highways usually deals with some of that through um, through dot's but ribbits is is definitely growing it is, um, as you saw by the hits, it um, gets a lot of use. It's a great public forum, you know, or, you know public database to, to get data. And it's why we need regulators to, to have not only availability or access, but to make it as efficient as possible. Good. So water quality on the rise. <laughs> and I expect carbon sometime too, but maybe not in rivets. I don't know. Other questions? Hi, uh, Lindsay Tunis, over in this corner. Um, Lindsay Tunis, uh, SWCA, and um, this question is for Steve and Becca and kind of want to continue down the path of picking apart all of the great data that you looked at or asking if you picked it apart. So <coughs> I have, I'm going to call it a two and a half part question. So I was curious whether you took your data and looked at those banks that are still being processed, meaning um, 
is the trends that you, are the trends that you saw continuing? Um, and I ask that as someone who has a bank that's definitely an, an outlier in and would not fall in the uh, current average that you're showing for the state that I'm working in. Um, and so I'm wondering if you looked at any banks that aren't closed but are still going through the process. And I'm also wondering if you saw any trends where there were multiple agencies, multiple credit types, uh, like California, where you're dealing with um, state and, uh, uh, and, and federal um, policy and, and potential credit types. And then my last piece was we've used the word consistency quite a few times today. And there's a great presence at this conference, as there always is, of regulators. But I'm just wondering, once again, how we have that trickle down. How do we actually get to consistency? Not just consistency data, but consistent commitment to the timelines. So there's my two and a half questions. You can take the first. That's easy. <laughs> oh, banks in the process. So no, we don't have data on banks in the process. We, we thought that would probably be un um, And Steve can tell you why later. Um, but then trends, multi-species banks. Uh, we were unable to see within the data itself whether a bank ha was a dual credit bank or something like that. Uh, there is the hypothesis that yes, that would contribute to the, the amount of time. And we added that to one of the caveats that we have in the report right now. Um, I, I will say also that Epic is doing some independent research, a follow-on in California specifically. And I've got a call with the <laughs> legal team tomorrow to see if we can access the data on the timeline of approvals in California. So wish me luck. Stepping, stepping back to the idea of pending, no, we asked in our FOIA, we sought only approved banks. That is where uh, a procedure in ORM, uh, DevMB, Develop Mitigation Bank, or Develop uh, in Luffy, uh had been completed. Again, we weren't entirely certain that we would be given or uh, pending actions would be releasable. So we only sought uh, those projects in which the action had been completed. And then you asked about uh, consistency of not only entering the data, but also of the approval process in general. I mean, we're kind of at this point where we've done the research, we have recommendations from the data itself, and now we're hearing all these ideas from people in the interviews. Um, so we're kind of rolling that up into themes, and we'd love to, we'd love to try to figure out with the Corps of Engineers, you know, what is implementable? What's the strategy for doing things? What's the low-hanging fruit? What's really difficult? Um, and having discussions like that. And in terms of uh, data consistency, uh, data entry, uh, Becca had referred to it. We have seen uh, quite a bit of variability among the districts in terms of when an action, a developed mitigation bank or a developed in Luffy actually begins. In some cases, it's started at the pre-app phase. In other cases, the clock is started or the timestamp is applied when there's a draft prospectus submitted, and still in other cases when uh, a complete prospectus has been submitted. Uh, so that certainly adds variability uh, in those overall calculations. Hey, good morning. Um, actually, compliments of, on all of the presentations. The information that this panel presents every year is just fascinating. You know, you just want to dig in. I have a, a question for Michelle um, regarding ribbits and, and really kind of the future direction of ribbits. Um, is there something that you can say to us about either additional info about PRM in ribbits in the future and maybe uh, monitoring info that might go there as well. Is that something that's on the topic of discussion? Thanks. Thanks, Richard. You know there is. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a topic that we've been talking about with our federal partners as well as other um, individuals. A lot of people come to us and ask us if they can see PRM. And PRM is, is obviously not third party mitigation and so it's not in ribbits. Ribbits to date has just been uh, for mitigation 
uh, banks and in Luffy programs, and also excludes advanced PRM, which is becoming, I actually didn't even show that data, but it was about 1% of the credit, credit withdrawals was APRM, which I don't think it even registered previously. So that is a, I'm probably gonna get in trouble for saying this, a bank-like, um, approach for a single user like a Sandag or a Caltrans or a, a VDOT that is, um, you know, doing a suite of projects for their own needs and in rapid succession and they just um, don't need to go through the banking process but they meet all of those same requirements. So. Um, Personally, and not speaking for core regulatory, there's always that disclaimer on anybody, right? Um, I would, and as a an, as an restoration ecologist, I would love to see uh, PRM, APRM in either ribbits or in one location so that we can see the whole suite of our mitigation program and learn from it. One of our big um, failures, in my opinion, is, is lessons learned. We are requiring bankers, as you guys know, to collect a lot of monitoring data. And you have been, many have been so forthcoming with their information several years ago, doing our hydrologic performance standard um, study at, with the Colorado State University, multiple bankers, um, let us on their property, gave us all their data uh, to develop a sort of a new-ish approach to, um, to performance criteria for hydrology. And their data was so robust and valuable. And, um, and I think that monitoring data, maybe Ribbits is not the right place because there's monitoring data by all kinds of other ecosystem restoration projects, but I want to be able to utilize that data to improve ecosystem restoration, including compensatory mitigation. We need a reference network. If you regulators had reference sites, you would much easier be able to, um, you know, validate whether or not a proposed site was a good site, right? If you had regional curves in watersheds, you would have a much better ability to evaluate a hydrologic uh, model that was given to you by a bank sponsor or PRM and determine whether or not it was um, valid for the proposal. So there's just, there's just so many benefits there and, um, and it's a lot of work on consultants, bankers, etc., to collect all of the data that they need in order to guess at what Mother Nature um, could provide at a site in existing constraints, and that information is just invaluable to me. So that is my 10-year plan until I retire, Richard, by the way. Michelle, can I add on? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. our, our president, Tim Bale, said the other day, he's like, there's all this data collected, but then it's used once. It's like a single-use razor. You know, it, it would be so valuable to the nation to have the jurisdictional delineations that have been created and approved, and that could be used as training data for artificial intelligence, you know, things like that. So, yeah. And if we mess up, we mess up, guys. Everyone messes up in ecosystem restoration, right? Like, we can't guess, right? Everybody has sites that you go, eee, I did that. But we learn from those, and we move on. So, let's not be afraid of the data. <laughs> As a follow-up to that, going back to the statistics that you collected on the time that it takes to get to the review process, did you, you probably haven't done this, but it would be good to know, those districts that are responding quickly versus those that take too much time, say, is there any correlation to the quality or the success of the mitigation banks? In other words, if they're going through quickly, maybe they're not looking at it closely enough. You know, you know, you understand what I'm saying? We, uh, we don't have data that speaks to that. Right. The, the data that we had was uh, basically the development and approval process. 
and it doesn't cover operations. I think that's a really important point, and I think that's an area where we need additional research to look at ec ecological performance of banks, of in lieu fee projects, and of uh, PRM across the country. Uh, but our data doesn't, doesn't include that. Can I, can I, I was looking for an opportunity to preach again. I made a great friend yesterday. I love this conference because I always make friends, smart people come here and um, I'm one of those people that will talk to anybody and get their cards and follow up. So I met Dr. Robert Keller last night and he had asked me um, a tough question in a panel earlier this, this week or the whole panel. And I have, I have court, and it was a quote by Herman Daly's work as an economist um, who linked uh, ecology, uh, you know, with with the value, right? The value of of our natural systems, and um, and his question to me is like, when do we just jump? When do we start moving? And, um, and the quote, I guess, from Herman Daly was like, just jump with a crude parachute. And I was like, yes, let's jump. So I think even if the sites that are being approved early or fast, whatever, um, and having that data to know how well they're doing is great, but we need to take risks, right? Because we are at the point when we need to move projects forward and we're just at the fringes someone else told me we're just at the fringes of this right compensatory mitigation is nothing relative to what is needed for ecosystem restoration but we can do our part so I would really like to see regulators given the ability and I think they have the ability there's certainly lots of flexibility in the mitigation rule to approve projects with more flexibility, spend more time talking to the bankers on, on potential adaptive management and funding that, and long-term management and funding that, so they can get something in the ground. And again, if they messed up, if we messed up, it's okay, we can fix it and or learn from it and move out, because there's really no time to waste. So thank you, Mr. Keller. And he also is a great uh, wine connoisseur, <laughs> just saying. That's why I was a little tired earlier up here. I have a question in the back. Is there a microphone? Yeah. Oh, we have a question too. Oh, and then we'll come here. Yep. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I think that we have enough data that we could take less risk if the data were available, it were analyzed and summarized and synthesized and put out there, and we could be learning from the 20 plus years that we've been putting mitigation in the ground more than just from our own projects. And I feel like that's a really lost opportunity. So there's a little bit of contradiction in what, <laughs> what you guys just said, which is we have all this data you know, we could be doing these things, but at the same time, we should just go out and do stuff. Yeah. Um, we could put those We're two things together and do even better stuff. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, so back here. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. I agree. I absolutely agree. You sounded like Devlin at first, so I was like looking for Devlin. <laughs> All right, we've got time for one more question. I think it's over here. Yeah, hi, Corey Wilson, Jacksonville District. Uh, so we know that performance isn't in the data set that you guys pulled, but what about size of project? Was a relationship identified? We didn't have size of the project. We didn't have number of staff. And we also didn't have um, information on a delay code. All of these things would be great factors to correlate. Um, we did try to correlate the number of banks approved in a district to whether they're fast or slow, and there's no relationship. So 